to go outside uh, and get in the fresh air. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. So sang Louis Armstrong. And there are many wonderful things in this world. But wonderful is not a word that lots of people would use to describe their lives. Our world is broken. We are constantly bombarded on the news, aren't we, of shootings and terrorist attacks. Wars seem to continue without ever ending. Natural disasters such as tornadoes and earthquakes and floods claim many lives each year. And despite our amazing modern medical technology, thousands and thousands of people die every year from cancer and strokes and diabetes or, or some other illness. Beyond this, we see greed and poverty and abuse and jealousy and racism. It's an ugly picture. This world is broken. We live in a country where 29% of children live in poverty. In the UK, 2.3 million adults are suffering in physically abusive relationships. In Great Britain, somebody is raped every seven minutes. In our world, 10 children die every single minute. And yet it hasn't always been like this. This world was once truly wonderful. Every single thing was good. So what went wrong? Well, that's a key question. What is wrong with our world? Christianity, I believe, provides the only satisfactory answer, as well as proclaiming the only solution. So very briefly this evening, I want us to look at three things as we think about that question of, of what's wrong with the world. First thing, perfect relationship, perfect relationship. We're going to briefly retread some of the ground that Dulan took us through last week, but it's an important foundation that we need to, we need to say. Before time began, God was there, Father, Son, and Spirit, one God, three persons, and they existed in a perfect, loving relationship. And we see that God has created the world and that his creation is the outpouring of his love. And that's important for us to understand. God did not just, didn't create us because he needed us. He did so for his good pleasure as an outflowing of his love. So creation is not just about our origins, but it's also about relationships. God's relationship with the world. God's relationship with us. Our relationship with each other. And our relationship with all creation. The center of all of God's creation was us, man and woman. In your Bibles, just turn briefly to, to Genesis chapter 1 uh, and verse 26 and 27. We're going to spend most of our time in Genesis 3 this evening, uh, but we are going to look, as I said, at a couple of other passages. So in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, they tell us that God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all of the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on earth. You see, unlike other creatures, we were made in God's image. And being made in the image and likeness of God, human beings have the ability to know God and therefore love him, worship him, serve him, and have fellowship with him. And as we saw last Sunday night, this is what we were made for, and God delights in that. And I appreciate, as we come here this, this evening, which is why I'm re-emphasizing it, our society, this flies in the face, doesn't it, of much of what our society tells us. It tells us that God doesn't exist. It says that we're here by chance, having evolved over millions of years from apes. So you can do what you like. But here we see that we were made by God 
to know God. And here in Genesis 1, Adam and Eve have a perfect relationship with him. For a time, they walked in perfection, freely communicating with him, free of fear, no sin, no sickness, no pandemics, no evil, no suffering. It was perfect. But secondly, and we're going to spend most of our time on this this evening, we see a broken relationship. So having seen a perfect relationship, we also see a broken relationship. Those of us of a certain age uh, can remember, will remember O.J. Simpson uh, being chased in his car through the streets of Los Angeles by hundreds of police. Back in 1994, I think it was, a live chase via being seen on a helicopter was something very unique and new. He, For those of you who don't know who he was, he was a very good NFL player. He was one of the best uh, to have ever played his position. Uh, but now he is probably best known for being accused of murder with one of the most highly publicized and questionable trials in history. He was acquitted of those charges, but he was arrested later on robbery and kidnapping. He threw everything that he had, and he threw it away. Nothing, though, compares to what was to come in the Garden of Eden. That perfect relationship that God had with us was about to be broken, and the consequences were going to be disastrous. Because God had given them one restriction, just one. They could eat from any tree in the garden, apart from the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God told Adam that if he were to eat from that tree, he would die. So in Genesis 3, you can turn back to that now in your Bibles. Another character enters the garden. Satan comes in the form of a talking servant. And he succeeds in persuading Adam and Eve to eat the fruit from the forbidden tree. And nothing has been the same since. So when we ask the question, what is wrong with the world? The answer is simply this. We have been separated from God. We have been separated from God. That relationship has been broken. And its consequences of that were immediate. In verse 8, we read, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Up until that point, Adam had never done anything wrong till he, till he ate from, from the fruit. He had never known shame, but now that had changed. Rather than having a, a vibrant relationship with God, he's resorted to hiding in a bush. And verse 10 tells us, that they were afraid uh, because they were naked. The shame in being naked, their innocence has gone. And that is a consequence of their disobedience. So now because of their nakedness, they, they hide themselves from the presence of God. See how quickly they've gone from being in a place of this perfect relationship with him to that they are, the relationship is broken so badly, they're having to hide. In verse 23, we see that Adam and Eve were taken out of the paradise of God and placed in the world at large to cultivate the cursed ground. Now, there's a little bit of grace in here because God moves them from the garden, so basically they don't live forever in a fallen state. Uh, imagine living forever in this world. They still had life, but the life they once knew was only a memory because of their sin. Banished from the garden with guards preventing them from re-entering. They were separated from God and it was because of their sin. And you and I are still dealing with that consequence today. From that moment, sin was in the world and we're all stained by it. Because it wasn't just Adam and Eve's relationship with God that had been broken. Our relationship with God died on that day too. All of our relationships with God died with sin. And we've been separated from him ever since. And now all of us have a sinful nature that affects every part of us, and we inherited it from Adam. So Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says that sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people. Even if somebody was to stop sinning, there would still be the problem of their sinful nature. That's why as Christians we don't preach to people, to unbelievers, to change their behavior. We preach to their hearts that they would come and have their heart changed. Every one of us is affected by Adam's sin. There are no exceptions. 
We're all now God's enemies because of the sinful nature rather than having a relationship with him. And it will result in a spending forever separated from God and being cursed. Dolan will be picking up on, on these themes next Sunday evening. But as we think about our broken relationship with God, we see its effect on other relationships on earth. Firstly, it broke our relationship with ourselves. Our society has a really unhelpful attitude towards self. And it's driven by the fall. After the fall, they they were naked, they were ashamed. Shame has altered our relationship with ourselves. And all of us, to some degree or another, struggle with self-worth because of sin. And in our world, we no longer see ourselves as made in God's image. Our value, our worth has to be self-created, which puts pressure on people who are then crushed by the burden and the hole that is meant to be filled with God. We try and fill it with other things, don't we? Like family and friends or, or likes on Facebook or whatever else you may be on Snapchat or what have you. But it also broke our relationship with other people. Immediately after the fall, Adam and Eve's relationship with one another took a turn for the worst. You can see that in verses 11 to 13. Look at the blame game that is going on. Adam blames Eve and God for his sin. Eve blamed the serpent. Our need to justify ourselves means that we put the blame somewhere else. As you go further on into Genesis, if you go into the next chapter of Genesis, Cain kills Abel. And the rest of Genesis follows in a similar vein. And it's so different to today. Our society has no, has no room for God, does it? Our society is about the fittest surviving. We look after our own interests. We don't think about people around us. That's how we can live in a country where 29% of children live in in poverty. That's how 2.3 million adults are suffering in physically abusive relationships. It's no wonder that we see injustice everywhere, that we see crime all over our televisions and news websites. Our race has done some pretty horrific things to each other, particularly when God is taken out of the equation. All of our relationships with each other changed when our relationship with God broke. But thirdly, it also broke our relationship with nature. The world itself was altered. So if you see verses 17 and 18, it reveals that man's sin caused the curse against the ground, resulting in thorns and and thistles and a change in the way our natural world works. I told you, didn't I, a few weeks ago that I hate camping. Right, one thing I hate more than camping is gardening. Uh, so I can really sort of, I, can, I get this. I hate it. And it's difficult, isn't it? Apologies to anybody who loves to spend time in their garden. I know there's some people that love that, and that's good. But it's much harder than it would have been. Originally, the earth would have produced all kinds of fruit really easily. But after the fall, that production was more difficult. Rather than being in peaceful dominion over the animals, we now fight with them. Our relationship with all of creation has been broken because of the fall. So what is wrong with the world? Sin is here. Sin is in our hearts. And as a result, we have been separated from God himself. Because of the sin of Adam, the whole human race is subject to corruption and immorality. And that is why humanistic approaches to fixing the world are misguided. That's why they fail. That's why as Christians, we know that even though think good things, such as more education, more money, more free school meals, more hospitals, more support for, for abused women, all of those things are good. But they don't get to the root problem of our sin and deal with it. And that needs something drastic. So I haven't seen a perfect relationship. We've seen a broken relationship. And thirdly, we see a reconciled relationship. I am a sucker for a happy ending. Right? I love it. 
hate watching TV films. If you, if you want to really annoy me, is tell me to watch a movie that doesn't have a happy ending. It'll affect me for like days afterwards. I love watching this, where the story is basically centered around separation and the subsequent reconciliation of characters. I don't know if you watch Pixar movies. I'm sure some of you love Pixar movies, and those of you that are telling me you don't, you're just pretending that because you don't think they're cool. But I love watching Pixar movies, and this is a central storyline. It is a staple storyline of virtually every single Pixar movie. Think of Finding Nemo. Marlin, the clownfish, is overly cautious with his son Nemo. So when Nemo swims too close to the surface to try and prove himself, he is caught by a diver and the horrified Marlin sets out to find him. So the film sort of, well, the film goes through, doesn't it? The whole story of how they eventually find each other again and and are reconciled. It's a good film if you've never seen that. Uh, Well worth your time. But we love those films, don't we? Because real life is not like that. There isn't a happy ending. There is pain. There's very often no reconciliation. We're just left to live the consequences and no hope of restoration of what we once had. But Christianity is the ultimate reconciliation story. Christianity is the ultimate reconciliation story. Reconciliation is at the heart of Christianity. Christianity and Christianity alone has the answer of how to fix this. Turn with me in your Bibles to to Romans uh, chapter 5 and verse 6 and following. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 and following. We read there, for while we were still weak, At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Notice the answer there isn't about a government activity. It isn't about us. It isn't even about a church program. Because if it was up to us, there would be no reconciliation. Because sin has put a huge barrier between us and God, and we are totally incapable of pulling it down. But God decided to do something about it. He moved towards us. He took steps towards us with love and with the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. He took his own righteous wrath against us by the atoning death of Jesus, our substitute. As Paul says, In those verses in Romans 5, whilst we were still sinners, Christ dies for us. He took our place. Rather than being punished, it was Jesus who was punished. Rather than us having to deal with the consequences of a broken relationship with God, Jesus did. There's that amazing verse, isn't there, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that says, For our sake, God made him, that's the Lord Jesus, who to be sin." who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is the person, the only person who has never sinned. And he ripped away our sin from us, and he put it on himself. And instead of just leaving us, he also gave us his righteousness. So what that means is, is that our sin is no longer a blockage between us and God. But Jesus has bridged the gap so that you and I can be reconciled. I don't know if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon. If you haven't, it is the most amazing and awe-inspiring place. You, they've got these buses that take you around different parts of it, but I can remember us being on a bus going to the, to the rim of the canyon, and as you go around a corner, you could see just a little bit of it, and there was an audible gasp of people just like, wow. When you get to the edge of it, one thing that really surprised me was how far away the other side of the canyon was. Think of a canyon, don't you, being quite small. The other other side is miles away. 
Well, if I wanted to get across there, well, I'm in no shape to be descending into the canyon and whatever temperature it is down there, 40, 50 degrees and walking down there and then trying to clamber back up the other side, crossing the Colorado River, whatever animals are there. Well, you can imagine the state I'd get into myself, myself into, sorry, trying to do that. But imagine, right, somebody had a bright idea, I know what we'll do. Forget about every photographs of this canyon. We're going to build a bridge from one side to the other. That's the sort of thing the Americans were doing it. Put a bridge from one side to the other so they could drive their car across the canyon. Suddenly, there is access because there is a bridge between both sides. Jesus is the one who came and isn't leaving us on one side of the canyon and God on the other. He is the one who bridges the gap between the two. Because this isn't a reconciliation where we meet God in the middle. You see that, don't you, sometimes, where two warring parties, they'll come and meet each other in, in no man's land and they'll, they'll agree not to fight each other anymore. We're not doing that. We contribute nothing. Because God was the one who accomplished our reconciliation for us at the cross. God was the one who offered our reconciliation through his son, the Lord Jesus. And it's not just us that are being reconciled, is it? Colossians 1 and Romans 8 talk of all things being reconciled and redeemed through Christ. That one day there will be a new heavens and a new earth and it will be transformed into perfection. He, Jesus himself will wipe away all our tears. Death and pain will be gone. Societies will not discriminate. Physical hunger will not exist. There will no longer be anything that is, that is separated from God, but everything will be reconciled with him. But until that day, our reconciliation with God as Christians means that there is a big change in this life. Sometimes we give the impression, don't we, and this is faulty that we do this, that we're reconciled with God, and that's all about what happens after we die. But it's also, there's some great truths and implications of that here. Because of our reconciliation with God, Jesus is the answer to our problem with sin, isn't he? 1 Peter 2 verse 24 says that Jesus has bore our sins on his body so that we are dead to sin and able to live righteously. Without being reconciled to God, you have no chance of being able to do that. Jesus is the answer, isn't he, to, to our guilt, our condemnation and our shame. Being reconciled to him means that there is now no condemnation for you. Your guilt can be wiped away. The slate can be made clean. That there is only one place that is safe for you. And that is the refuge of Jesus. Shame pronounces us guilty and deficient. Jesus says that we are guiltless and promises that his grace will always be enough. Because we are reconciled uh, to God... It means there's no need to fear and worry, is there? We live in a world of fear. But Jesus speaks into that and he says to us, if we come to him, that he will give us the peace that passes all understanding, even in the most difficult and desperate situation. The fact that we are reconciled to God helps us in our relationship problems. Jesus is close to the brokenhearted. He is the one who shows all compassion. He is pure, unbounded love. He offers a relationship that is greater than any. Our reconciliation means that we no longer need to worry about an uncertain future. Because the one who holds the whole world in his hands loves us, cares for us, and is working every single thing to our good. Our reconciliation to God means that we have an answer to hopelessness and despair. Because we know that we were hopeless. And we can say that Jesus dwells with the hopeless, that he lifts up the hopeless, he sustains the hopeless, he provides for the hopeless, and he saves the hopeless. Our reconciliation with God means that there is no need for us to be lonely anymore. Jesus gets that. He was despised and rejected. But he is always there. He promises never to leave you, even when everybody else does. He will not. Separation from and reconciliation with God is not just about when we die. It also makes a huge difference to our life on this earth. So as we begin to draw to a close, what does that mean for us? 
Well, the first question is, are you separated from God or have you been reconciled? Are you without him? And as a result, have no answer to things like your guilt, your shame, your fear, your hopelessness. Or have you been reconciled and have God with you through this journey? If you're separated from God this evening, what is stopping you from being reconciled to him? He says, come. He says, I've made a way. What is stopping you coming? Why would you turn down something as wonderful as this? Jesus allows you to live life to the full. Life without shame, without fear. Life without loneliness. And you're going to say, no thanks. Come to him. This evening, ask him to forgive your sins and to be reconciled with him. But if you are a Christian here this evening and you know that you are reconciled to God, that should be humbling, shouldn't it? Because we all know that there is nothing that we did to be reconciled, that it was all about Jesus. And so your first response should be to worship him, but it should also make us think. Because if Jesus went to such lengths to be reconciled to you, why are we not reconciling with those around us? You see, biblical reconciliation doesn't stop with vertical reconciliation towards God. It goes further. It reaches into the horizontal with one another. It makes us uncomfortable. It pushes us to speak to people outside of our comfort zone, to pursue people and pursue peace with them where we find it difficult. Is there someone that you're avoiding? Is there someone with whom your friendship has broken down? Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 tells us that now we have been reconciled by Christ. And we now then have a ministry of reconciliation too. And what's interesting is Paul doesn't say that he had moments of reconciliation. He is saying that God has given him and us the ministry of reconciliation. So therefore, reconciliation is what we do. That should be true of us. Because true reconciliation is not just some word of a concept that is just sort of floating around in midair. It's grounded. It's gritty. It sits in the middle of our resentments towards each other. You see, our church should be the most reconciling, peaceful, relaxed, happy place on the Gabalva estate. And it should be so by a country mile. Because Jesus has broken down the wall of hostility. He has created, hasn't he, a new human community by re reconciling us all to himself on the same terms. His broken body on the cross. And his great message to us now is peace. Since we all share the same access to God. This is true equality in a world of division. That we all come to God together by the reconciling power of the gospel. And because of that, we're open to our enemies. We even love them. We're meek in the face of insults and injuries. We're forgiving towards the undeserving because we are following a higher call to make peace. As Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, the true sons of God. So we've seen a perfect relationship became a broken relationship. But you this evening can have a reconciled relationship. Let's keep Jesus at the center and embrace the truth that he bore our suffering and made a way to be reconciled so that we can show that same reconciliation to others. Amen. Well, we're going to finish with a song uh, that I hope we're going to continue to sing.